Well, hello, hearth and homies. Welcome to the OTR Visual Radio. I'm your host, Mr. H. Thanks for joining us for this compilation. Now, just before we get into the show, I want to take a minute to talk to you about the Johnny Dollar Club. What's that? You've not heard of the Johnny Dollar Club? Well, let me tell you about it. As many of you know, this channel is not an ad supported channel, but it does take time and money to keep the channel going and to make these shows. So one of the ways you can help keep us on YouTube is by joining the Johnny Dollar Club. All you need to do is look for the links in the description below or over in the chat or down here if you're on your phone or in the comments. And you can choose between patreon.com or buymeacoffee.com and check out the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting out at just a dollar a month, you can help support the channel and get access to exclusive content. But now let's get on with our show. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. System presents a thrilling new adventure series starring Dick Powell. I'm an insurance investigator. My name is Johnny Dollar. What? You heard me, Johnny Dollar, and I can pad an expense account with the best of them. I'm a freelance insurance investigator, and I live in Hartford, Connecticut. At least that's where I pay rent. My work sees to it that I really live anywhere, except at home. If you're interested in buying me Christmas presents, I take a size 42 suit. Shirt's 15 and a half collar, sleeve length 33. My hat size is 7 and 8, except when I wind up a successful case. Then it runs about 7 and 3 eighths. At insurance investigation, I'm just an expert. At making out my expense account, I'm an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, East Coast Underwriters, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Austin Farnsworth, General Manager. The following is an accounting of my expenditure as an investigation of Milford Brooks III for your company. Expense account item one. Cab fare to your office in answer to your original call, 75 cents. Tip to driver, one dollar. Expense account item two. Shoe shine, 25 cents. You'll remember I got my shoes scuffed when I unsuspectingly walked into your private office. Milford! No, you must get out of my way, son. Dollar! Get yeah, it, you away from that window! Don't hey, you, you! Let go of me. Oh, 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 no, no, you don't! Let go of me! Let go of me, you fool! No, no, there are better ways of making a big splash in life. Yeah, don't worry, you... Well, nice try, Sonny. Now pay attention to teacher. <sighs> Oh, ah, I didn't know I had it in me. Oh. oh, goodness gracious, Dollar. Did you have to hit him so hard? I hope you haven't killed him. He isn't too strong, you know. Uh, don't worry. There. Oh. Now, now, Mr. Farnsworth, would you mind telling me on whose head have I the dubious pleasure to be sitting? Now that, sir, is Milford Brooks III. His policy with his company is in the amount of two million dollars. Wow. Yes. And the boy seems bent on committing suicide. Dollar, I want you to stop him. Now what do you want me to do? Threaten him with death? Anything, anything. The conditions of his policy are such that we would be forced to meet with a claim in the event of his suicide. Oh, I say, Dollar, sitting on his head that way, aren't you in danger of smothering the boy? Smothering him doesn't worry me, but these crew haircuts don't make very comfortable cushions. I'll move down a little. Ah, now, there. Okay, okay. So far, I know this kid is insured for two million and that his policy pays off on suicide. What else? One half hour ago, Milford Brooks walked into this office and changed the beneficiary in his policy. Uh -huh. Then, sir, he proceeded to demand, not request, mind you, but demand a loan of $500,000. Quite a touch. When I explained to him that there were no provisions for a loan in his policy, he threatened suicide. Which would cost you $2 million. So all we have to do is keep him alive, huh? And he's managed to make that no small problem. His choice of a new beneficiary is downright frightening. One of the most notorious gamblers in the East. His name is Hatcher, uh, Harold Hatcher. Ouch. Oh, do you know him? Sure. 
That kid's been a post office pinup boy for a lot of years. Well, that's the situation. I'm engaging you to protect Milford Brooks' future. Dollar, I want you to protect the boy. Uh, give him something to live for. You know, an interest in life. An interest in life? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's see. Um, oh, I know here. This should help. What's that you got there? Well, it's what's commonly referred to in the more successful of bachelor circles as my little black book. Oh. Well, now, let's, uh, let's see. Hmm? Hmm. Ruby? No, no. Her favorite expression is drop dead. Uh, uh Bernadine? Mm, no. She'd be the new beneficiary by midnight. Oh, dear. Now, here, here. Here's the one. Butter. Say, Farnsworth, would you mind passing me that phone? The one with the long cord? Oh, no, no, of course. Lie still, Buster. My little friend here is showing signs of life. Here, here you are. Uh, maybe you should let him breathe a bit more. Ah, don't worry, don't worry. He'll be all right. Hello. Oh, hello. I want to call New York. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hudson, 24292. Dollar, you're not thinking of taking this boy to New York, are you? Well, I'm going there myself. You want me to keep an eye on him, don't you? Now, don't fret, Farnsworth. All is not lost. You do worry me, sitting on his chest that way. Hello? Hello, oh, buddy? Oh, this is Johnny. Yeah, I'll be in town tonight. I want to see you. And look, here's what I want you to do. Yes, yes, it's all right to say over the telephone. Yeah, I want you to reserve a table at the hatchery in my name for 10 o'clock tonight. Will you do that? Okay, I'll see you at your apartment in a few hours. But, honey, I can't make it any earlier. I'm sitting up on a sick friend. Okay, goodbye. I'm not sure that I agree with your methods. Huh? Ow! What's the matter? Uh, did he hit you? Hit me? He bit me. <laughs> Expense account, item three. Liquor, $18. Keeping Milford Brooks the third peaceful seemed to be the immediate problem. And a bottle of rare old brandy seemed to be the immediate answer. I poured most of it into him, and by the time he started to tick again, he'd gone through the unusual process of going to sleep sober and waking up enchanted. I loaded him into my car, and we headed for New York. As we passed through New Haven, he opened one eye, looked up, saw the Yale Bowl, and gave three cheers for old Eli. Ray, Ray. Gail would sure be proud of you. Why anybody would want to insure you for two million dollars is more than I can figure. My daddy loved me very much. Hmm. And my mother loved me very much. Now that's nice. And not only that, but I love somebody very much. And not only that, but I hate somebody very much. That's interesting. You know something? Next to one other guy, I hate you. More than anybody else. Oh, here, lover boy, it's a cocktail hour again. Time for your bottle. <laughs> Rolling along the Merritt Parkway, I felt very much alone with my thoughts. And believe me, they weren't very pleasant company. The way it stacked up for me, Brooks had built up a fat gambling debt with Harold Hatcher and had been forced into making him his beneficiary. The suicide threat that he was holding over the insurance company was a little tougher to figure, unless he was trying to finance a trip for himself to get away from the man with a murder motive, Hatcher. Hmm. My hungry little mind nibbled away on those unsavory morsels of food for thought all the way to Butter's apartment. Hey. Hey, where are you taking me? I want to go to New York. If you don't behave, Buster, I'll punch your ticket. Johnny, darling, welcome to New York. Well, that's the fastest trip I ever had. Quiet. Well, where did you find this? In a box of Cracker Jack. Let us in, dear. I don't know about you. Some men bring me flowers, some bring me candy. What do you bring me? A boiled owl in a Brooks Brothers suit. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, let's trot him into the bedroom, honey. You'd look more at home in the bathtub. Let me pull down the cup. All right. Now, come on, Buster. Lie down. Charm, charm, charm. Uh... Ah, oh, that kid's liquor sure can hold him. How long have you been playing nursemaid to this bottle, baby? Get behind that bar, sweet, and I'll tell you all about it. Sure. 
horrible examples don't seem to bother you, do they? If you knew how that guy has been bothering me. What did he do to you? Well, let's just say he put the bite on me. No. Um, Gosh, the river sure does look pretty tonight. Bourbon and soda? Now, please. Anything but brandy. I've been sniffing that second hand all the way from Hartford. Butter, see that big boat out there? Mm-hmm. Oh, I sure would like to be on it. With you, sailing off to faraway romantic places. Get with it, darling. That's the 125th Street Ferry. Oh. Here's your drink. Come on now. Tell Butter all about it. So, friend Bourbon and I proceeded to tell her all about it. It wasn't easy. Everything about her kept flagging down my train of thought. The longer she looked at me, the less I wanted of Milford Brooks the third, and the more I wanted of beautiful Butter the first, and only. She was a sympathetic listener to my story until I gave her the answer to her first and only question. And where do I fit into all this? Well, baby, I thought you understood. My job is to give this poor misguided boy something to live for. That's you. Well. Mm. Now, honey, hold everything. Don't go getting your corn all popped. You, you misunderstand. I really mean it. I thought if he'd just got to look at you and realize that things like you exist, why, you'd make any man glad to be alive. Oh, oh, come on now, butter. Melt a little. I wouldn't let anything happen to you. You know that. Did I hurt you? Oh, no, I'm getting used to it. People have been taking pokes at me all day. I'm sorry. Ah, that's better. You want some more, Bertha? Uh-uh. I want some more you. Well, help yourself. Honey, it's getting late. Let's uh, make this the last drink. Mm. What time is it? Oh, it's uh, it's uh, twenty to ten. Oh. My reservation at the hatchery is for ten. Here. Thanks. Cigarette? Oh, empty. Some more out in the other room. I'll get it. I'd love to get you on a slow boat to China. Johnny. Oh, I'm coming. He's gone. What? Well, he can't be. But he is. The window's wide open. Oh, the fire escape. What a smart guy I am. Trading three drinks of bourbon for two million bucks on the hoof. Oh, that's the biggest bar check I ever picked up. That's a big bar check for anyone to pick up. As a matter of fact, it's a bigger bar check than you've ever heard of anyone picking up before. And that should give you an idea of what to expect in the second act as you follow this new CBS series starring Dick Powell in the title role, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Nobody could say I wasn't working fast. I'd only been in town for an hour, and I'd already succeeded in losing Milford Brooks III. I spent another hour of his all-too-short life expectancy unsuccessfully shaking down the neighborhood for him. And then, feeling very much like a bloodhound that had flunked his sniffing exam, I went back to Butter's apartment. No luck, Johnny. Oh, sure. Plenty of luck. All bad. Is there anything I can do to help? Uh, a kiss for luck. Mm. What are you going to do? Nothing. Just a little phone call. Police headquarters. Now, this is Johnny Dollar. Give me missing persons. Any particular one? Now, don't be a wise guy. Lieutenant Fisher. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Fisher. Fisher, this is Johnny Dollar. Hello, Dollar. Who'd you lose? Well, one man, my mind, and if I'm not careful, my professional reputation. The guy's name is Brooks, Milford III. Got anything on him? Hold on. All right. Oh, don't look at me like that. It wasn't all my fault. Dollar? Yeah? We haven't found him yet, but we think we know where he is. Huh? The Hudson River. At 11.15 tonight, his top coat, complete with identification, was found taking a ride on the 125th Street Ferry. Oh. Anything else? 
Um, nothing much. A package of matches was found under the coat monogram. Uh, you don't happen to know anybody whose initials are H.H., -H, do you? H.H.? -H? Yeah. There's always Horace Height. Uh, uh, thanks, Fisher. I'll check back with you later. I'll be here. H.H. Mm, -H, Harold Hatcher. Mm. What are you mumbling about? Bad news? Mm, looks like about two million bucks worth. They uh, found Milford's coat on the 125th Street Ferry. <laughs> you and your faraway romantic places. <laughs> Very funny. Now, I'll see you later, honey. It may be about 11. <laughs> Expense account, item four. Nightclubs. $28. Harold Hatcher's hatchery was in a cellar under a hotel, but the prices were high enough to raid a penthouse. The club was draped in too much satin, its lady customers in too little. The decor was French provincial, the music was Brazilian, and the food was from Dixie. The drinks looked weak and the waiters looked strong. All in all, the joint was a sight for sore eyes, for making them sore. The only pretty thing in the place was a blonde. She came strolling up to my table, her hips unconsciously sending subtle little messages back to the rumba band. She opened her mouth, slid her tongue over her lower lip, and let a few warm, soft words slide out. Looking for someone? Well, you'll do until the real thing comes along. Sit down. Thanks. I won't have a drink. Well, I didn't ask you. My name is Janelle. Janelle? Wow, well, it's a nice name. I understand you were asking about Mr. Hatcher. Well, I asked if he was in. The waiter said he wasn't. Do you know him? More than somewhat. What do you want to see him by? A mutual friend, Milford Brooks. Uh-huh. I know most of the quiet clothes boys around here, so you want a cop. You don't look like the type that would be a society friend of the Brooks family, so what are you? Uh, I'll ignore that. Is Hatcher around? He might be. Then come on, where's his office? The top of those stairs. Can I expect any trouble getting in? You won't have any trouble. How do you know? Because Harold sent me down here to look you over. Oh. I think you're all right. So, I won myself the good housekeeping seal of approval, huh? Keeping a house with you would meet with my approval. I ran for my life at a slow walk up the stairs. When I located the door to Hatcher's office, I knocked once and went in. Come on in. Thanks. So I'm Johnny Dollar. I was hired by East Coast Underwriters to protect the interest of a kid named Milford Brooks III. Now, oh, what's that supposed to mean to me? You know him, don't you? Well, he isn't exactly one of my boozing buddies. How much money does he owe you? Well, we've got him on the books for a few, Bob. Why? They picked up his top coat tonight on the 125th Street Ferry. He wasn't in it. It might have been suicide, or it might have been a knockover. It made it look like a suicide. What's your choice? What do you get off asking me about my choice? Where were you between 11 and 11.30 tonight? What's it to you? I thought you might like to rehearse some answers. The law will be asking some questions real soon now. I don't know why I should tell you, but I was driving around in my car getting some air. Oh, now, you'll have to do better than that. They found one of your match folders under Brooks' coat. You're out of your mind. Let me ask you. The kid owed me a couple of hundred thousand. You think I'm going around knocking off my own assets? Hatcher, I, I don't know whether you're stupid or bright. Don't worry about it. I know. What about that insurance policy? What insurance policy? Now, look, Hatcher, we're big boys. We both know that changing a beneficiary in an insurance policy is a legal transaction. That means witnesses. That means it isn't secret. What are you talking about? That you and East Coast underwriters and I know all... All know that Brooks made you the beneficiary in his policy and that you stand to come into two million bucks when they fish out his body. I don't know anything about it. Motives don't come much bigger. I'm telling you, this is all news to me and you and nobody else is going to make me move off that story. I feel the same about mine. It doesn't take a genius to know that Brooks didn't love you two million dollars worth. There's only one logical reason for his making you the beneficiary. You forced him into it. Who'd believe anything else? Who cares? They'd have to prove it. And brother, that can't be done. Now, how would you... Yeah. Okay, Rocky, thanks for the news. Take the inspector into the bar and buy him a drink. I'll be right down. Dollar, did you turn me in? They're here, huh? Yeah. No, I didn't turn you in. I'm not a cop. Well, come on. Maybe they just want to sell me some tickets to the policeman's ball. For a guy in a hot spot, Hatchet was certainly a cool customer. I followed him out of the office, down the stairs, and back into the club. 
Janelle was sitting there right where I'd left her. And I thought to myself, now there's a gal who should never sit down. She looks so pretty standing up. Janelle, buy Mr. Dollar a drink. I have to go play 20 questions with some fellas in the bar. Sure, baby. Anything you say. Anything. I'll see you, Dollar. Yeah. How'd you make out? Well, you can never tell about a guy like that. He's a smart boy. Strong, silent type. Wouldn't talk, huh? A real close mouth act. About what? Oh, just a little doodad. Two million dollar life insurance policy. Wait a minute. That young Brooks kid? That's right. I knew it. Tried to tell him he'd get into trouble, but he wouldn't listen to me. Oh, you knew about it, huh? I suppose you also know what was behind it. Sure, Milford owed him some money. A lot of money. It's in writing. What kind of writing? It's a personal note that Brooks was going to get back if he made Harold beneficiary. Well, where is this note? Do I look like the kind of girl who'd put the finger on her boyfriend? You look like the kind of girl who'd do anything if she wanted to. Thanks. I'll give you a slight hint. It's in his office. You'll find it in the inside pocket of one of his suits in the wardrobe. What are you waiting for? I'll watch the bar. Nothing, sweetheart. Nothing at all. Whatever her reasons, Mr. Harold Hatch's little female playmate was trying awful hard to send him up on a murder rap. And I was going to try awful hard not to let her down. Back in Hatch's office, I found myself alone in a room with a telephone. And being a guy who can never resist a free call, I unleashed the magic wonders of the AT&T. This better be you, Johnny Dollar. Shh, quiet, Butter. I've only got a few seconds. Seems that's all you ever have for me. Now, if you... Now, look, Angel, I... Angel, just another hour. I'll get you a nice present. I don't care if you're another century. And as for presents, the last one you brought me was a drunk. And you even let him get away from me. Good night. <sighs> Life presents a gloomy picture ever downward toward the tomb. <laughs> Having wasted those few precious moments of an already misspent youth, I decided I'd to get on my pony before Mr. Hatcher showed up. I found Milford Brooks' personal note in one of Hatcher's suits, all right. As a matter of fact, I found something in all his suits. A great big glimmer of light. <laughs> Expense account, item five. Taxi fare, ten dollars. I left the office in a hurry. Janelle at her table and Hatcher at his bar. I got out of the club and into a taxi parked a half block down the street. There, I waited until my favorite suspect left the hatchery and piled into another cab and off we went. On a chase that would have made Ben Hur look like a plowing bee. We skittered over to Lexington and headed uptown. At 72nd, the cab turned right and pulled to a stop. My driver was on his toes, and his toes were on his brake. We stopped, too, half a block behind. You want us to wait, huh? No, here you are. Keep the change. Hey, thanks! It was a garage that belonged to a residence on the parallel street a block away. The living quarters upstairs were dark enough to look interesting. I indulged in a bit of genteel breaking and entering. Entering that old barn didn't take much breaking. I crept up the stairs. It sounded like they were left over from an old ghost story. And so did the first voice I heard when I stopped halfway up. We've got to be careful, especially about that Johnny Dollar. Are you sure he didn't follow you? That voice sounded awfully dry to be coming from a guy who supposedly had spent most of the night snoozing in the bottom of the Hudson River. It was Milford Brooks III. Get up on your feet, Brooks. But now, wait a minute, I... I started this thing slugging you, and I might as well finish it the same way. Leave him alone. Now, pull in, pull in the claws, Angel. <laughs> and sit on his lap. <laughs> You're hard for it. I'll kill you. Get off of me. Huh? I should have known better than to get mixed up with a low-class female like you. Why, you, Pop? Now, hold it. We've pushed the lady around enough, Brooks. Tell me to be careful, will you? Why didn't you think of that before you let him here? Wipe your nose, little boy. Now, don't you go getting fat-headed, gorgeous. I'm only interested in one thing. Saving the insurance company $2 million. And, Buster, I think you've done it for me. Dollar, I... This is insurance fraud. It has been, ever since you put on that fake suicide attempt. 
Trying to extort 500,000 bucks out of the company. Dollar, wait a minute. Now, ah, come on. We're leaving. You heard him, Dollar. Harold. Catcher. He said, wait a minute. He wants to talk. Yeah, everybody wants to get in on the act. How did you get here? When the police in this town think maybe a guy's jumped off a ferry boat and nobody's seen him do it, they check the counters on the turnstiles at each end. In the case of Brooks, as many people got off that boat as got on. Well, it makes sense. They'd hardly hold a guy because somebody lost a top coat. Oh, how did you know we were here? You know me, baby. You never go any place I don't know about. Okay, Brooks, you felt like talking. Now I feel like listening. Get it up. Well, I... I don't know what you mean. I know what you mean, Hatcher. One, he gave you a big, fat $2 million motive for murder. And two, he did his best to make it look like you did murder him with that broken-down match cover plant on the ferry boat. It's just that simple. And you, baby? Harold, please. You put him up to it, didn't you, you cheap little muscler? Trying to get rid of me, will you? No, Harold. Now, calm down, Hatcher. You don't need any gun around here. They're tame. Well, maybe I'm not. Since so many people have gone to so much trouble to hand me a nice, easy way to make $2 million... Maybe I'll just go ahead and make it. I'll show these amateurs how these things are really done. Come on, Brooks. How'd you like to go for a nice, cool, half a ferry boat ride? No, Edger. No. Look, it's her fault. I'll give you anything you want. You're wrong, sonny boy. You're going to give me everything. No. No. You can't. Let me out of here! Brooks bolted for the door. Hatcher snapped a shot at him. And I hit Hatcher with a do-or-die tackle from behind. The gun flew out of his hand. No, you don't. I beat him to it and swung it straight into his skull. Half the people were lying in the room bleeding. Brooks from gunshot, Hatcher from gun butt. And Janelle and I both stood there panting. Ah, but believe me, not for each other. We stood that way until the police arrived. It's beyond me. I sent you out to protect the life of a very important policyholder. And now where are we? Standing in a hospital corridor, worrying about whether he's going to live or die. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Farnsworth, you're only half right. I'm just standing in a hospital corridor. Dollar, you're heartless. If you'd been bitten where he bit me, you wouldn't care if he'd uh, lived or died either. I'm getting out of here. Well, where are you going? It'll be explained in my expense account under miscellaneous expense. Now, don't fall over when you come to an item for $318. $318? For what? Not for what, Farnsworth. For whom? Expense account total. And it all adds up to a little matter of $1,182.23. Which, you may say, Mr. Farnsworth, is a lot of money for one man to spend in two days. But you must bear in mind that the amount of steak was $2 million. And you know the price of steak these days. It might comfort you to know that I just returned from the hospital. Brooks was strong enough to make a full statement, which you will find and close. This in itself should prove sufficient to establish evidence of attempted fraud against your company, allowing you to immediately avoid his policy. It uh, boils down to one sentence, to wit. Brooks and Janelle wanted to get rid of Hatcher so that they could live happily ever after. Knowing those two, they never had a chance. And oh yes, that, uh, <laughs> that miscellaneous item, the one for $318, it, uh, it was a bracelet for a certain party who made this special investigation for me very special. Oh, if you want a receipt for this item, I'll send you a lock of her hair. Yours, uh, mm, truly, Johnny Dollar. So, with the final signature on his expense account, Dick Powell as Johnny Dollar has just closed the books on his first adventure in this new CBS series. Tune in again next week when the expense account covers Special Investigation Singapore, another unusual adventure starring Dick Powell in. You 
yours. Mm, truly, Johnny Dollar. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, American Continental Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures, fulfilling your assignments as a, uh, a bodyguard. The body being that of your late policyholder, Robert W. Perry. <laughs> Expense account item one. Fare on night train, Hartford to New York, $3.80. Expense account item two. $1.80, taxi to Lower Manhattan the following morning. Two officers, Perry and Van Bruten, importers, arriving as promised at exactly 9 a.m. May I help you? Yeah, my name is Johnny Dollar. I have an appointment with Mr. Perry for 9 o'clock. Oh, yes, from the insurance company. Well, you're right on time. Yeah, they told me I'd better be. Mr. Perry just came in. He's alone and waiting for you. I'll buzz him that you're here. Thanks. was left of your policyholder, Mr. Perry, was just sliding out of his swivel chair as I hit the room. The top of his desk had erupted, and splinters of mahogany pointed their sharp fingers upward through lazy circles of smoke swirling toward the ceiling. The buzzer from his secretary's desk had been rigged to a booby trap. Oh, oh no, Mr. Perry. Stay away from him. There's nothing you can do for him. He's dead. Oh. What happened? What happened? Whatever happened? Come on, we let's let's get back out of here. Hey, Lana, sit down. I'll get you a drink of water. There you are. Uh, just drink this. We have an explosion. I turned in the alarm. Has anybody heard? There's a doctor on the third floor. Should I call him? Never mind the doctor. Call the police. And nobody gets in here until they arrive. And the rest of you, go on, beat it. Run along. And turn off that alarm. Okay, miss. Now, just take it easy. But it was all so sudden. What happened? Well, that's not too hard to figure out. Somebody wanted to give your boss, Mr. Perry, a shortcut through life. So, whoever it was, figured out that a secretary would never buzz her boss unless he was at his desk. They rigged up a bomb somewhere in his desk that would go off when you buzzed him. Oh, but... But I killed him! Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't get hysterical on me. There's excitement enough around here, and there'll be plenty more when the police get here. Keep cool. But I did it. You saw me do it. Look, the way you put it, I killed him by coming in here and giving you my name so you'd buzz him. Drop it, will you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, now, uh, what about yesterday? Was he here? Yes, all day. What time was it when you last used the buzzer? Oh, like, right up to the last minute, about 5.30. Uh, who left the office first, you or Perry? Mr. Perry, he always leaves first, and I lock up. Well, from the looks of things, you should have used more locks last night. Somebody got in here to do some wiring. Uh-oh, I forgot that fire alarm. All that equipment and no fire. Look, before the police arrive, do you know why I was sent here? Yes. Mr. Perry recently felt that his life was in danger. He thought that, well, with a $100,000 policy, the insurance company would do everything they could to help keep him alive. Well, we didn't have much of a chance, did we? What was he afraid of? I don't know. Okay. What were his other appointments for today? He only had two. His partner, Mr. Van Bruten, at 11. And then... now, one at a time now. Van Bruten, anything special about their meeting? Yes. Mr. Van Bruten arrived just yesterday from Holland. You mean there was a branch of this firm in Holland? Yes, and Mr. Perry was buying out Van Bruten's interest. They had their final meeting at Van Bruten's hotel last night. Oh? Uh, 
Van Bruten was coming by this morning to pick up his money. Uh, cash? No, a cashier's check. The bank is to deliver it here at 10.30. Now, quick. Perry's other appointment. Who was that? Christine, his wife. Oh, yeah. Now Christine, the beneficiary. Yes, but she wouldn't have been the beneficiary in another two weeks. They were getting a divorce. Thanks for the motive. You don't like her? I didn't mean it that way. Hmm. How about Perry? Did you like him? Okay, well, here's an easy one. What's your name? Susan. Susan Gates. Now, isn't that about enough? Okay, Susan. You'd better save your voice. During the next few hours, you're going to have a lot of talking to do. Oh, here come the firemen, and we haven't even got a child to ask them to save. Where's the fire? I'm looking for a fire. Just stick around. When the cops get here, somebody will get burned. The firemen should have stuck around because the cops arrived in a blaze of glory. It was a very high-class investigation. Two lieutenants. Finally, after about an hour, the police photographer ran out of flashbulbs, the office of the deceased ran out of fingerprints, and the lieutenants ran out of questions. So the on-the-scene phase of the investigation was closed. At about five minutes of 11, I left the police to pack up their notebooks, their clues, and the body, and went into the outer office. Susan looked like she could use a big, broad shoulder to weep on, but unfortunately, I was wearing my light gray suit. About then, a dark blue suit and a deep green voice entered the room from the corridor. Say, there's some fella out here who says he belongs here. His name is Van Bruten. Shall I let him in? Oh, what do you think? His name is on the door you just opened. Oh, indeed, now. Well, my name happens to be Murphy, and it's on beds all over the country. But that don't mean I'm stuffed with feathers, does it? <laughs> This'll teach you, Johnny Dollar, never to cross tongues with an Irishman. <laughs> okay, send him in, officer. Yeah. All right, you can come in. The policeman out there. Is that trouble here? Oh, uh, I am Bremer Van Bruten. Where's Mr. Parrott? What? He's waiting for me, no? No. But my appointment... He's not keeping any. He's dead. Dead? This is impossible. Last night I saw him. He was well. What happened? He was hit by a buzz bomb. A buzz bomb? Please. Ah, uh, sorry. I forgot other people aren't used to these things. You mean that was foul play? Very foul. Please, may I sit down? My first visit in all these years since before the war. It was to be so happy. Now, tragedy like this. He was a good man. A good partner. I understand that as of last night, you were no longer partners. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I realize, of course, that it is indelicate to speak of such things as money at a time like this. But that is why I'm here, to receive my payment. Oh, just because Perry got his, there's no reason for you not getting yours, huh? But you misunderstand me. I am deeply grieved. Since the transaction was consummated, what is there to do? A delay would be a needless waste of money. I have already paid for passage back to Amsterdam tomorrow. Your check is here, Mr. Van Bruten. Here you are. Thank you. In all my years of business, this is indeed the saddest moment. Yeah. Yeah, those are very kind words, Van Bruten. And I'd believe them if your eyes would stop counting all the zeros on that check. <laughs> Expense account, item three. Ninety cents. Phone call to your company. American Continental Life Insurance Company. Good morning. Uh, well, that's a matter of opinion. This is Johnny Dollar. Put me through to Mr. Gordon, will you? Yes, sir. Mr. Gordon's office. Look, honey, this is Johnny Dollar. I want to speak to Gordon. Oh, and uh, while I'm telling him what I've got to tell him, maybe you'd better sit in his lap with some smelling salts. I'm not that type of a secretary. And besides, he doesn't have a lap. Hello, Dollar. How are you making out? I owe about $100,000. What's that? Yeah, somebody turned Mr. Perry into a firecracker. He's dead. Oh, that's bad news. It's a big policy, you know. Yeah. Look, what I want to know is, shall I stay on the case? Oh, certainly, Dollar. Certainly, by all means. Uh, by the way, is, uh, is there a chance of uh, proving suicide? There's a non-payment clause. To make this one a suicide, there'd have to be a Santa clause. Nobody could hate himself enough to do it this way. Well, what are the fraud possibilities? Uh, only fair. There's an estranged wife. She's the beneficiary, but uh, she wouldn't have been in a couple of weeks. Divorce coming up. I'll start with her. Uh, all right, Tyler. Good luck. But watch those expenses. Why, Gordon, I'm surprised. I think an insurance man would be the first to want to see a fellow live a little. <laughs> 
Expense account, item three. Cab fare, $2.80. Tip to driver, $1. Christine Perry's apartment was on Sutton Place, overlooking the river. And from what the doorman told me, all of the proprieties. I took the elevator up to the 24th floor, and there I discovered that our garden fresh widow was living high in more ways than one. Everything about the place was French. The maid that led me into the living room, the decor, and the perfume, which reminds you that breathing can be fun. I looked up from enjoying my nose to see Mrs. Perry looking down hers. Mr. Dollar? Oh, Mrs. Perry. I believe we can dispense with any getting acquainted. You're an insurance investigator, interested in the death of my husband. So naturally, you're here because you've jumped to the conclusion that I killed him. Oh? Well, you're the one that's jumping to conclusions, lady. Then what do you want? If the policy's in order, the premiums are fully paid. I'm not quite sure. I know that you've got a great motive. So far, the only motive I've found. You haven't had much time to look, have you? Check. This is my first stop. Maybe you can help me. Do you know anyone who would be happier with your husband out of the way? I know very little about my husband's friends. Or for that matter, his activities for the past six months. That's when I left him. Uh-huh. Well, that's not much help for either of us. You know, without someone else to suspect, I may just have to concentrate on you. Mr. Dollar, I picked the men I want to concentrate on me. Well, I hope you're as long on alibis as you are short on your temper. Where were you last night? With a friend, Al Donovan. For a while, the same place my husband was. And I have witnesses to prove who was with him. Anybody at the Club Caprice can tell you. Well, save me a trip. I can't afford the prices they get there. Certainly, pleasure. My husband was with his beautiful little secretary, Susan Gates. Well, I wouldn't be more surprised if your late husband walked through the door and said that... All right, mister, that's enough. Oh. Yeah. How, how much did you... I'm hear? a big guy, baby, six foot four, and I've got big ears to match. Oh, please. Would this be Mr. Donovan, your companion of last evening? I'm getting you out of here, Christine. I don't know what you're saying. You lie to me. How can I help you if you lie to me? You call me stupid. The way you're playing this, you'll alibi yourself right into a cell. I'm getting you out of here. What are you doing to me, Al? You're crazy. Come on. She's right. You are stupid, Donovan. She was doing just fine till you dropped in. Mister, you've been asking a lot of questions. Now I'll give you one answer. No. All right, Christine. So much for the wise guy. Now about you and your alibi. You wasn't with me at the Club Caprice last night. And if it's so easy to prove your husband was there with his secretary... Who were you there with? You told me you were going with your husband, talking divorce, remember? When Al measured me for that swing, I measured my chances with him. To me, he looked like one of the corporate assets of Murder Incorporated. So I rolled with a punch, hit the floor, and stayed there, with my eyes closed and my ears open. What I heard was Christine's alibi flying out the window, Mr. Donovan giving her a few loving cuffs, and finally the pair of them flying out the door. I allowed myself the luxury of a 20-second massage on the new lump on my jaw, and then I got up and started out after them. This case was becoming interesting. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, this important message. Sixty million dollars is what the Red Cross needs to carry on its great work in 1949. If this seems like a lot, just try to review briefly the various activities of the Red Cross. It can't be done briefly. Red Cross services extend into every area of our lives, bringing care, comfort, and recreation to the men in the armed forces, bringing first aid training, nutritional programs, nursing services, blood banks to our own communities. And all the time... As these activities go on uninterrupted, the Red Cross is holding itself ready to spring into instant action in case of disaster. Fire, flood, explosion, any sort of catastrophe finds the Red Cross on the scene with food, clothing, and medical care. Sixty million isn't so much in the light of such activity. We can make it with each of us contributing. We're giving to our own safety, security, and peace of mind, and to our neighbors, too. So let's give generously to our own Red Cross. And now back to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
I hit the street just in time to see Donovan pushing Christine Perry into a cream-colored convertible. When they got rolling, I piled into a cab and followed them, and the chase was on. At 57th and Broadway, things got complicated. My cab was three cars behind theirs when a red light flashed them to a stop. Then the door of their convertible flew open. Christine jumped out, dashed across the street, and down into the subway. Since Donovan didn't follow her, I followed him. When he finally pulled to a stop, he took two chances. He parked in a no-parking zone and walked straight into the building beside it. A police station. Uh, this is Mr. Dollar, Lieutenant. He's been waiting for you for some time. Huh? Well, you can wait outside, Sergeant. Okay, sir. My name is Johnny Dollar, Lieutenant. Here are my credentials. Hmm. Insurance, huh? Yeah, the uh, Perry murder in particular. Hey, you've come to the right place, Dollar. A man named Donovan just walked in here and made a full confession. He what? That's right. My clerk's just typing it up. In the meantime, the gentleman is down in the tank having a bite of lunch on the city. He confessed. Does his story add up? As far as I know. I haven't heard too much about the case myself. It's not in my precinct. What did he use for a motive? Jealousy. Says he's in love. Wanted to marry Perry's wife. Uh, did he say how he managed it? Yeah. He stole a key to the office from the wife's apartment, entered the building last night, and wired a bomb to the buzzer system. Uh-huh. Well, guys do a lot of strange things in the name of love. <laughs> Yeah, looks like Donovan did. Ah, he either killed a man, or he's trying to cover up for someone who did. Well, listen, don't uh, execute him for a couple of days. How, huh, Lieutenant? I spent the rest of the afternoon downtown in the offices of Perry and Van Bruten, importers. The partner's correspondence told me two things. They had been extremely friendly, and uh, Van Bruten was extremely bald. Perry had been sending him two pays from a famous Hollywood makeup firm. At 4.30, I opened the drawer marked Employment Files. They rocked me with two minor explosions of their own. The folder marked Donovan Albert J. told me that he'd been employed as Perry's bodyguard over a period of years, and that he was canned the day before the murder. Before I received blast number two from the folder of Perry's secretary, Susan Gates, the office door opened behind me. Well, Mr. Dollar, you're supplied with a search warrant, I hope? Just the one I was born with, Mrs. Perry. The kind they say kills cats. You know, curiosity. What are you looking for? I found it. How about you? What are you doing here? Oh, I... I'm tired of dueling with you. I'm here because I want to... Well, I've got to talk to someone. I called your hotel, you went there... I tried to locate Susan, but I couldn't, so I thought maybe you'd be down here. What's the basis of our sudden friendship? You should know. Al Donovan's confession. The newspapers have it already? Yes, but there's not a word of truth in it. He didn't kill my husband. How do you know that? Because, what? why, it's impossible, that's all. Yeah, it was a little hard for me to swallow, too, when the police told me about it. But since then, it's become a little more digestible. What do you mean? I just learned that he was your husband's bodyguard. He was fired yesterday. That same day, your husband calls his insurance company screaming for another bodyguard. Now, how would that add up for you? A beef, maybe? Al Donovan's a fool. He never thinks. He just rushes in and says it does whatever's on his mind. He told my husband if he didn't divorce me that... Well, he threatened him. You now, you came in here saying that Donovan's confession was no good. And you spend your time making it sound better and better. What do you want, anyway? I can't help it. I, I've got to tell you the truth. I know it doesn't sound like I'm trying to help Al, but what can I do? You really want me to answer that? Here. If you want to help Al, phone the police. Tell them Donovan made that phony confession to cover up for you. It's simple. Not as simple as that. You don't need the gun, Christine. Hang up the phone. Sure. I hope you don't mind my aversion being held for murder myself. Oh, well, that's a common aversion. I'm in no hurry to see you behind bars. But don't forget, when the cops want to pick you up, they'll do it. Now, don't spoil the rest of the afternoon. Take that gun someplace else. I've got things to do. The first, I imagine, will be the call that I wouldn't make. Well, not necessarily. If it'll make you feel any better, we'll just put this phone out of order. 
satisfying? Of course not. But don't get me wrong, Mr. Dollar. I wish you nothing but success in your investigation. I puzzled over that exit line for a few seconds after she'd gone. And then I went back to the company's employment file. Namely, the application for employment as secretary of Susan Gates. It informed me that during the war she had worked in a munitions plant. Her specialty? Wiring bomb fuses. When Miss Susan Gates reached home at 8.30 that evening, she found a visitor, me. How did you get in here? A professional secret. Oh, you scared me. What do you want? Why did you come here? I wanted to bring you the good news. I uh, heard on the radio that Al Donovan confessed to Perry's murder. Al? I can't believe it. Why not? Who do you like for the spot? Why, Christine. Al is covering up for her. I'd like to agree with you. If it turns out that Christine wound up her husband's life with a bang, the company that hired me saves $100,000. But I don't know. She claims she has all kinds of alibis. One of them is you. Me? Yeah. Did you see her at the Club Caprice last night? Why, yes. I know who you were with. Your boss. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I'm not preaching a sermon. I want to know who she was with. I don't know. man I'd never seen before. Mr. Perry knew him, but he wouldn't tell me who he was. Why not? I don't know. He said I might get the wrong idea. About what? I don't know. We didn't sit there and talk about it all night. Why should we sit here and talk about it all night? All right, all right. When a census taker shows up and asks a lot of questions, people answer them. When an investigator tries to do his job, they make the proverbial clam look like a blabbermouth. Look, Mr. Dell, believe me, this has been a greater shock to me than to anyone else. Excepting, of course, your late employer, Mr. Perry. How long did you work for him? Four years. Now, where'd you work before then? Why, I... I... Oh. Let me help you. Bombs, wiring fuses, remember? All right, I remember. Good. Then maybe you'll remember a little bit more. Let's go back to last night. The guy with Christine Perry. Who was he? I tell you, I don't know. Was it Van Bruten? I don't know. You don't know? No, I mean... I'll get that. No, I'll go. You make sure you just don't keep going. <laughs> Susan! <laughs> When Susan snapped the spring lock to open the door, the gun outside opened up. The first slug caught her in the left shoulder, spinning her out of the way of the rest of them. It was getting monotonous. Every time a buzzer went off, things started booming. Susan was sprawled out on the floor in front of the door. And to open it, I had to move her. By the time I did, the hallway outside was empty. Okay. Come on, take it easy. It won't start hurting for a couple of minutes. I'll have a doctor here by then. He'll give you something. Now just try and keep calm. Here, I'll throw my coat over you. I'll try not to move. Oh. Trying to ruin this rug. Never mind the rug. What we want to worry about is who tried to ruin you. What'll they do to me? What will who do to you? They'll arrest me. No, they don't arrest people for getting shot. Do you have any idea who it was? That man in the office this morning. The one who picked up the check. Van Bruton? No, no, he wasn't Van Bruton. He was a phony. Yes. And you still gave him that check? Yes. Well, I won't ask you why. But apparently you gave him the money and then tried to blackmail him. Is that right? No, arrest me. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Who is this guy? Where can I find him? <gasps> Come on, now, don't pass out on me now. His name, quick. Vincent. Where does he live? Nelson Hotel. Under his own name? Oh, I don't... I don't blame you. I could use a few moments of unconsciousness myself. The Nelson Hotel didn't have a Dutch name on the register, so I got a hold of the housekeeper and found out how many rooms his staff hadn't been able to make up all day because of do not disturb signs on their doors. I went a calling at these particular rooms. On the ninth floor, I awakened one old maid. On the seventh, I startled a bunch of poker players who thought they were being raided. On the fifth, I blushed my way out of the bridal suite. And on the fourth, I struck the door of 427 and the jackpot. Who's there? 
Don't you see the sign? I do not wish to be disturbed. Oh, uh, sorry. I must have the wrong room. I started up the hall after the fire axe, but when I got to it, I changed my mind. One of the few things I'd learned about this guy Van Sant was that he loved to murder people through doors, so I decided against trying to chop his down. Then I remembered the way those people came pouring out of those offices earlier in the day when they heard that fire alarm. So I picked up the little red hammer next to the big red fire axe, broke the little glass window, pulled the little brass hook, and set off a big brassy noise. Then I rushed back to 427. Fire! Fire! Where's the fire? Right here in my eyes, sweetheart. You, why you come here? You wish you hadn't. Never mind the dresser. You're, sh- you're through shooting guns for the day. Oh. Oh, what do you think, Vincent? You want to try some more? You cannot make me stay here. The fire, we will all die. You look good barbecued, but I'll make a deal with you. You talk. And if I like what I hear, I'll show you how to get out of here alive. How do I know this? Well, you don't think I'm going to stay here and fry, do you? And if you don't start flapping that tongue in a hurry, I'll probably just tie you to a chair and run. First, where's Van Bruton? You will find him in the bedroom. He better be alive. He's out cold. What's the matter with him? He will be all right. He's on the sedatives. Where did this identity switch start? You better hurry up. I smell smoke. I knew Van Bruten in Amsterdam. I knew about the sale of his interest. And I knew that the girl in the office here had never seen Van Bruten. Well, let's go now. Uh, don't get up. I can feel it getting warm in here. The firefighters. We will be saved. Now, don't be too sure. They always start at the top floor and work their way down. Come on, I can hear those flames crackling. You know the rest. Last night, when the transaction was all finished with Perry, I gave to Van Bruten some sedative and his cocoa. You set up that bomb so Perry'd get it before you showed up to pick up the check. Yeah, I told you that. Then it happened that girl didn't know I was an imposter. I don't know how. Well, let me tell you. She's been sending old Van Bruten in there two pays for the last four years. Gray ones, my red-headed friend. Oh, yeah. Let us get out of here, no? Yeah, out. Oh, <laughs> Expense account item four, a dollar forty. Night letter informing you that American Continental would have to meet payment of claim to Mrs. Christine Perry, innocent widow of the insured. The only thing she was guilty of was trying to stay on the right side of a hot tempered boyfriend. <laughs> She lied about who she was with at the Club Caprice, not to fix herself an alibi, but to keep Al Donovan from learning that she'd been out with another guy. That guy being the real Mr. Van Bruten, who had only taken her out to try to talk her into reconciling with his friend, her husband. Item five, sixty dollars, silver chafing dish. Wedding present for Christine and her new husband, Al Donovan. Well, that was the least she could do for the guy who had confessed to a murder he thought she had committed. Item six, eight dollars. Flowers for Susan Gates, prison hospital. Item seven, fine for turning in false alarm. One thousand dollars and no cents. And that's what I think I'm beginning to get for getting into this racket. No cents. Expense account total, twelve hundred and sixty-three dollars. Yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, this reminder. Just a little earlier tonight on CBS, Jack Benny turned dramatic actor on the Ford Theater. But this Sunday, he'll be back again on his own show with a special treat for the Jack Benny fans. After the last broadcast on which the Ronald Coleman's appeared, thousands of letters came in from fans asking that Jack invite Ronnie and Benita back again soon. The Waukegan Wit did, and Ronnie and Benita, by popular demand, returned to the Jack Benny program this Sunday in what should result in one of the most hilarious broadcasts of the year. So be sure to listen to Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman on the Jack Benny Show, which is heard on all CBS stations this Sunday. (laughs) 
Listen in again next week when CBS brings you Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music by Mark Warno, and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mrs. Perkins won the prize, but I got in the biggest pickle at the county fair. This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense accounts, he is an absolute genius. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, Corinthian Liability and Bonding Company, Terminal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my assignment as bodyguard to Grand Blue Ribbon Champion, Spotted Poland China Hog, Rosie Barron of Iowa, or How You Cast My Pearls of Wisdom Before Swine, or out of the fire, into the frying pan. Rent account, item one. $76.80. Train and bus fare, Hartford, to the town of Carver, county seat of Carver County, Iowa. Rent account, item two. Two fifty. One Coke, three handkerchiefs, a bottle of salt, tablets, and sunglasses, with which to combat the corn belt heat. Item three, six bits. Get me ride to the Carver County Fairground. Undoubtedly named that because the band I found in the midst of playing its afternoon concert was only fair. Hey, uh, uh, friend. How's that? I'm looking for a pig named uh, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Tell me where I'll find his cage. Cage? They don't keep Rollo in no cage. Rollo? Who's he? Well, that's short for Rosie Barron of Iowa. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any fool would know that. Uh-huh. Can you tell me where he is? See that building over there, the livestock building? Yeah. You'll find Rollo in the swine wing. Swine wing? Uh-huh. Well, that conjures up a dainty picture. A flying pig. <laughs> Afraid Rollo won't ever do much flying. Weighs 980. Oh, well, thanks a lot. Uh, old neighbor. Yeah? Why don't you try slipping out of that there coat? You won't find it near as sweaty. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Hiram. Well, he didn't even wait to be my best friend. Hey! Wait, wait, I'll come with you, neighbor. It was 96 in the shade, but things were getting hotter. Got some trees from the livestock building with the only thing to play in the garage. With Hiram on my heels. What are you fool that one? First, I ran into a stranger just outside the entrance. Get out of the way. Let me out of here. There's loose and loose there. Then I ran into the door. Somebody do something. Don't just stand there. Where's the sheriff? Hey, uh, Hiram, Hiram, what happened? Well, why didn't you see? Didn't you hear? That there woman's Mrs. Stewart. Somebody must have stole her diamond boot. Oh, good. I was afraid somebody might have put the snatch on Rollo. Her husband owns Rollo. Uh, oh. They must have been taking her pictures of Mrs. Tiller in the middle of a crowd. And, and when they had her smiling real pretty, them flash bulbs went off. And then somebody must have reached around from behind her and yanked the boots and started shooting a gun in there. That's a tried and true method of busting up a crowd to help make a getaway. You think anybody saw who did it? Uh-uh, couldn't. Yeah, those flashes would have had him blind as bat for a minute. Oh, 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 oh. There's the sheriff. What's his name? Uh, that's, that's, uh, Harry Blewett. Harry Blewett? Yeah. Sounds like a slogan from the Republican campaign. Hey, here, here, you... you oh, I, 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 wait a minute, let's go. When everybody around here is trying to get my coat off. Come on, Sheriff. Loose the habit of that. All right, now, never mind the fancy talk, young fella. I saw something pass between you and one of the thieves just outside the door. Oh, you're out of your mind. That guy bumped into me. He came crashing out of here, and I happened to be in the way. I'll bet you happened to be in the way. Accidentally on purpose. Now, that's an early American comeback. But that's the way it was. Now, look, I won't ask you for a search warrant, Sheriff. You think I got the brooch on me? Start looking. All right, I will. All right. Now, in that pocket, cigarettes and a lighter. I see them. You see? Yeah. And uh, in that pocket, handkerchiefs and salt tablets. Salt tablets? Mm-hmm. Now, why don't you look in my inside coat pocket? 
And there you'll find my wallet and identification. I was coming to that. You, well, yeah. Dollar, insurance investigator, right. Hartford, Connecticut. Well, what brought you out here? I'm a piggy sitter for the Corinthian Liability and Bonding Company. They wrote a policy for $25,000 on your friend Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Who ever heard of taking out a $25,000 insurance policy on a hog? I did. And right now, I wish I hadn't. Some people pay high premiums for publicity, Sheriff. And that's what the Blue Ribbon Prime Packing Company is doing in this case. Now, may I have my wallet back? I want to count my money. Yeah, now, here. All right. Here's your wallet. You may think you're quite the joker, young fella, but I'm telling you right now I'm going to keep an eye on you. I got a better idea than that, Harry. If I were you, I'd go looking for that photographer. Yeah. Why? What did he do? He took the picture. And there's just a chance the thief may be in it. Yeah. Say, that gives me an idea. Sheriff, whoever says you aren't smart makes no mistake. <laughs> the prized porker wasn't hard to find. First, I followed a few signs. Then it was a matter of closing in on a contented series of juicy, slurping grunts that came blooping up out of a succulent mound of Louisiana yams. Rollo was all fat and a yard wide, but his table manners weren't much. He didn't look very smart, but he sure looked healthy. 980 pounds, well, a, a fine figure of a pig. Uh, pardon me, miss. Could you tell me who's in charge around here? Well, just for the moment, I am. Well, I'm trying to find a Mr. Worthington Tiller, who I take it owns this monster. Monster? What? What? Well, what what's the matter? Have I said something wrong? <laughs> you certainly have. And you've also said it to the wrong person. In case you don't know it, my name is Alva Anderson. Oh, my name is Johnny Dollar. How do you do? Uh, what's all this got to do with Rollo? Nothing. I just raised Rosie Barron of Iowa from a suckling, that's all. Trying to get away from you, didn't I? Oh. I sorry, Miss Anderson, I apologize. And to you too, Rollo. I'm uh, sorry about the interruption, Miss Anderson. Some fool made off with my wife's diamond brooch. Oh, uh, how is this excitement affecting Rollo? Oh, I hope he hasn't lost any weight. Well, you took it very well, Mr. Keller. Oh, good, good. This uh, gentleman wants to see you, <clears throat> Mr. Dollar. Oh, 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 from the insurance company. That's good, right. good. Well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, we'll have your picture taken right away with my well, wife and uh, Rollo. Oh, it'll make... Grand publicity for Blue Ribbon Prime Packers. Oh, I don't mind having my picture taken. Yeah. Just so long as your wife doesn't mind having people pinch your diamond brooches. Oh, well, then, don't worry about that. It was fully insured. Oh, that kind. The huh? thing I want you to worry about is Rollo here. Mm -hmm. As president of Blue Ribbon, I paid Miss Anderson $10,000 for this magnificent swine, and I don't want anything to happen to it. You bought him for 10000 insured him for 25000 and you don't want anything to happen to him? Yeah, well, I don't mind paying those exorbitant premiums when I get back the kind of publicity this will bring in. I, I, you know, I can see it in the papers now. America's fabulous insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar, sent from Hartford, Connecticut, to guard the life of that fabulous prize swine, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Near well, Mr. That. Killer, I don't mind getting my name in the paper for yeah. a pig, just so long as it is not in the obituary column. I just couldn't stand having my tombstone read, Johnny Dollar no longer am. He gave up his life for a great big hand. <laughs> Tombstone tagline was over the head of Mr. Tiller, but it went over right nicely with Alva Anderson, who paid off with a smile. I parlayed that into a conversation, helped me pass the time while guarding Lalo, the poor man's blue boys. By the time it was over, Alva knew a lot about me, and I knew a lot about pigs. You know, you have beautiful eyes, Alva. Mr. Dollar, do you know what's really interesting about the origin of swine? Why, it's estimated that the Chinese people domesticated swine about 2,900 B.C. And not only that, but I'm sure you'd like Hartford. And Mr. Dollar, you probably don't know this, but a pig is one of the most important food animals. It's an economical converter of grain and other feeds into body tissue, as the products of which furnish meat and fat for human consumption. 
Well, the darling, I'll only be in town for a little while. And not only that, but people who say that pigs are dirty don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Why, sanitation is essential to good health, rapid growth and development, and profitable production. Oh, Rollo, what have you got that I haven't got? <laughs> I still don't know whether Alba stuck around because of my charms or Rollo's. But she was still there at the changing of the guard when Mr. Tiller, in person, came to relieve me long enough for a trip to the dining hall. And what do you think they had for dinner? What else? Bay Cham. Oh, oh, dinner was wonderful, Johnny. Coming from you after eating Bay Tam, that sounds practically cannibalistic. Oh, Johnny, stop. Uh, more coffee? No, I've had it. Alba, you know, there's something I've been trying to say to you for the past five hours. Yes, Johnny? Well, it's just that... Well, I want... Oh, yes. oh, 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 why doesn't he blow his siren? Well, I, I have to be going. It's time to get Rollo ready for the winner's trade yeah. track of the grandstand. I'll just run along. I'll just go with you. Hey, hey, go it. Go it. I want to talk to you. Well, I'll see you later, Johnny. Yeah. Well, Sheriff, hey... You being a sort of investigator, Dollar, I knew you'd be interested in my methods. Well, you're sure interfering with mine. Huh? Yeah. Oh, well, do you know what I did? What? I found that photograph, right? Had that picture developed and rushed it up to the state capitol. Mm-hmm. And they just called me. Dollar, there's a known criminal in that photo. He's got that brooch and he's on the loose. Do you know what that means? Yeah. It means that you shouldn't be sitting here talking to me. Who is this villain? They say he's... Who's over there, there? Well, they say he's known as Little Rock. Originally hailed from Arkansas. You'd know him if you saw him. He's the fellow that bumped into you. I want you to help me look for him. I take only one job at a time, Sheriff. Right now, I gotta take them out. I think it was the Grand March. Boy, in case I'm interested later, how much do you pay your special deputy today? Seven dollars. And expensive. Sheriff Blewett, I'm afraid that blows it. The Carver County Pickle and Pie winners were lining up to lead the Grand March by the time I got to the grandstand. Down at the tag end of the livestock echelon, there was a shiny white cab and trailer sporting the markings and mottos of the Blue Ribbon Prime Packing Company. And high upon it, perched on a platform and surrounded by a sturdy iron railing, stood that champion, the pride of the fort set, Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa. It was lovely. It was divine. I had a feeling that swelled my heart with pride. Here they were, products of the American home and the American soil. A fanfare of foodstuffs flowing from the home of plenty. Just because of my association with Rollo, I felt that I was playing some small part in this gallant parade as it was started the first leg of its journey. It was inspiring. It was thrilling. It was... All of a sudden, it was downright frightening. As Rollo's chariot rolled by, I got an eyeful of its driver. It was my comrade in collision, the guy who had put the snatch on Mrs. Tiller's diamond, Little Rocky from Arkansas. I added to my treasury of thankless tasks by trying to pin a tackle on a five-ton truck. Go ahead with one hand. Let me move with one foot. And I took my feet from an unexpected adversary. Knock him loose, Rollo. He's on the landing board. Hey, what? <laughs> Everybody was screaming and hollering and crashing into the place. And Rollo, those who dared to buy a was one little piggy who wasn't staying at home. In just a moment, the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first. Taking in the action from Johnny Dollar, are you? All right, that's good, because staying with CBS is the way you'll head straight for the big return from vacation eight days from now, Monday the 29th, of Lux Radio Theater and all the other big Monday night CBS favorites. And by staying with CBS, you'll find more action later tonight with Bill Grant of Call the Police and with Sam Spade, who will be heard from on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Oh. Johnny, did Johnny, are you all right? Can you get up? Oh. Uh, 
it's I good, really Willing. I'm not sure about my it's spine. Here, here, let me help. Oh, I'm um, the guy who goes around telling kitties never to hitch rides on trucks. Oh, okay. Well, nobody can say I didn't make a dent in Iowa. Oh, it was wonderful the way you tried. But what are you going to do now? Right now, I don't know. The only place I can think of at the moment where I might find a hot pig is a barbecue stand. Well, this is no time to be funny. Well, look, up until now, all the laughs are on me, kid. So let me be the judge, huh? Uh, well, what are you going to do? Well, first I'm going to practice my arithmetic and see what adds up. You can't unload a stolen pig in a pawn shop. So, question number one is, where do you unload it? Where would you go? Well, where would I... Well, I'd never thought of it. Well, here's what I figured. The Rolo on the hoof is too well known to pedal for anything like the dough he's really worth. I mean, he's not like a big diamond that you can cut up and look... Or is he? What is the going price on pork? I uh, said so market this morning was at twenty three fifty. Oh, well, that kind of money hardly sounds like little Rocky's kind of project. But maybe things are tough. By the way, Alba, have you ever been in Arkansas by any chance? Why not? Why do you ask? Just wondered. Hey, dollar, dollar, just a minute. I want to. Oh, talk to you. Sonia, I'd blood in himself. Yeah, Sheriff. If, if you mind, Alvin. I was just leaving. How could she be that cold on such a hot night? Huh? What's bothering you, Sheriff? I saw your little performance, Dollar, when you leapt at that truck. Just how hard was you really trying? How hard was I? I ought to punch you in the nose, badge or no badge. Uh, uh, now, now, don't you go getting huffy. I just want you to know that I don't fool easy. When I'm on a case, I'm suspicious of everybody. Yeah, that must be rough on your wife. How often do you have her in handcuffs? Huh? Well, that... Hello, oh, Sheriff. All I need from you is the use of a car so I can go looking for old Lardhead. Oh, no, you don't. There's enough missing around here as it is. Rollo, Miss Tiller's jewelry, and I ain't about to add a county vehicle to the mess. And besides, I want to keep an eye on you. Good. You might learn something. Come on. Here, here. Wait, wait a minute. Where are you going? Over to the Ferris wheel. That truck hasn't been off the fairgrounds in more than a couple of minutes. I want to get a look at the countryside. Ferris wheel. Say... That gives me an idea. I hoped it would. Come on. Say, uh, you know, Sheriff, I don't know very much about this farm-side ferreting racket. Well, there's more to it than meets the eyes, I can tell you that. Oh, yeah, I'll bet there is. Tell me, didn't I see a feed trough on Rollo's truck with a lot of mash in it? Well, now, let's see. If he ate yams this afternoon, he'd eat mash tonight, all right. Does mash kick up any kind of a smell? Oh, sour swill. But the pig seems to like it. Ah. Uh, how does this sound to you, Sheriff? Suppose right after you take your ride to the top of the first wheel to case the countryside, we were to get ourselves a nice hungry pig. Say, that gives me an idea. We could take that pig and he could smell that mash in the air and sniff out the trail of that truck. Sheriff, if you aren't a genius, I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, Shaw. Sure. <laughs> it was planting time in Iowa that night, at least for ideas. Two of which I had planted in the not too fertile mind of Sheriff Harry Blewett. And as long as it took us to walk from the trotting track to the Ferris wheel, it came harvest time for notion number one. <laughs> Big wheel, big wheel. Honey, hurry, honey. Okay, Mr. Okay, I'm the sheriff. I want you to run me up to the top of that wheel and hold me there long enough for me to get a look around. When the wheel came to a stop with Harry Blewett sitting in his little cage at the top, I pulled a low trick on a high sheriff. I bought a pink lemonade from the juice stand next to the Ferris wheel, walked over to the motor that rolled the big heat, unscrewed the cap on the gas tank, and gave it a big, long drink. I hope it wasn't doing to people's stomachs what it did to that motor. You might well remember this harmless little deceit the next time you have occasion to get rid of a sheriff. Uh, uh, this kind of publicity is uh, a little too expensive, Dollar. I demand that you do something. Now, don't worry, Mr. Tiller. I am going to do something. Uh, uh, and I'll thank you to remember that the only ones who stand to get hurt right at this point 
of the insurance companies that wrote the policies on your pig and your wife's diamond brooch. Why, Wilmington, I hadn't thought of that. Huh? Why should we worry? My brooch is insured for way over the value oh, there. We oh. had Hortense. The... Oh, you keep flapping that loud tongue of yours. The first thing you know, they'll be accusing us. Why, they wouldn't dare. Oh, yes, we would, Mrs. Tiller. This is just not the time. A $15,000 profit on a pig and whatever else you could make on your jewelry might make anybody the type, Mrs. Tiller. I no, 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 don't you hear, Dollar. I've had just about enough of your slanderous implications. I have a few thoughts you might profit by. Go ahead, Worthington. I'm always interested in profit, Tiller. My father had the yeah. same thing happen to him back in 1902. That's right. Remember, dear? Yes. In Nebraska. He bought a prize pig at a fancy price. And then the scoundrel that sold it to him turned around and stole it back. Hmm. There. Eh? Eh? What do you think of that? Hmm? Would this huh? be uh, a suggestion that we throw the young lady who sold your pig to you in the pokey? On the strength of something that happened 37 years ago? Well, that, no. That's for you to decide, Dollar. Right. Just don't say I didn't warn you. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have an orchid to pin on the young lady, try suspicion. With most of the crowd packed in the grandstand watching the three attractions, I had a good chance to scout the fairground for Alva Anderson, from whom I wanted to learn a little bit more about the habits of not only pigs, but their ex-owners. A trail led me past the home-baked cake, hybrid corn, the watermelon pickle, tractor and harrow exhibits, and all the way back to where I first met her, Rollo's tent in the swine wing of the livestock building. But when I got there, Rollo's cover was bare. Alva was leaving for the rear door in the company of a small, tough-looking gent carrying a sack over his shoulder. Name of Little Rocky from Arkansas. I could hardly believe it. They piled into a car and hauled off up the road. At the risk of adding one last insult for the most recent injury I'd inflicted upon Sheriff Blewett, I stole his car and went dusting up the highway in hot pursuit. Nothing easier to follow than a red tail light on a clear night. And the bright Mazda Ruby tanked onto the rear of Little Rocky's car led me around the village of Carver and 11 miles out to the pastures to a shack hidden in a grove of elm trees a hundred yards off the road. I parked the car. I legged it in. It was 25 feet away from the house. I could call the roll through an open window. They were all there. The Rocky, the strong arm man who would knock me off the running board, Alba Anderson, and last but not least, there was Rollo, all 980 pounds of them, and most important to me, still alive. Here you are, Milo, you stupid clown. Oh, stop. This is all the sweet potatoes that was left. First you go through them, and then we'll be ready for you, Alba. Oh, but I told you I don't have it. We'll see about that later. Hey, Milo, don't get the porker excited. I didn't care. Put the sack on the table. And then when we look at him, we throw him out the window with a wave from him. Now hurry up. All right. Well, it ain't in this one. Uh, uh, ain't in this one either. Nope. Ain't in this one. Shut up. Just look. Well, I just... Now, from now on, from you, no thinking. Anybody dumb enough to stash a $30,000 hunk of jewelry and pig food ought to go to your head, doctor. Oh. <laughs> Through the open window, I was being bombarded by sweet potatoes and bags. While making a getaway after ripping the brooch from Mrs. Killer's throat, Little Rocky's accomplice had suffered a sudden attack of panic and hidden the brooch in one of Rollo's lunchtime yams. Whether that yam was inside the piggy or out, they and I were apparently just on the verge of learning. Uh, yeah. here. Then that, means that means your little friend here had a thirty thousand dollars snack today, which right now is giving me a great big belly ache. You know all about pigs. What do we do about it? Well, Rocky was yelling. He wouldn't rub them out. Look who's talking. Here, take my thirty-eight if you're so tough. Yeah, I thought so. Now shut up. Well, I ain't killing no piggy with him just standing there looking at me. Hey, if he'd only make a break for it, I'd mow him down. Ah, you. Now look, baby, we'll kill him if we got it. We want that chunk of ice and we want it fast. Milo, tease him into the corner with a sweet potato. We're throwing them all out the window. Oh, please, Mr. Rocky, you don't. You shut up, too, and sit down. Close your eyes if you want to. Oh, please, Mr. Rocky. 
<laughs> In the manner of Sheriff Blewett, I had an um, idea. Right. Give it to me, of course, by Rocky. Alba was sitting in the corner. Rollo was scratching his side by rubbing it against the opposite. And Rocky and Milo were standing shoulder to shoulder in the middle of the room, ready to advance on him. I groped around the dark until I found one of the ends. And taking a sweet potato delicately in my hand, I tossed it through the window so that it would roll to a point just behind Rocky and his pal Milo. Oh, God! Rollo took my face and getting to it, knocked his two would-be executioners in a heap on the floor. I took over from there, jumping to the window and applying the kitchen the chair to the place of the material, reducing enemies to a state of unconscious surrender. They gave out. Alba gave up, and Rollo gave me a dirty look. <laughs> well, Mr. Tiller, here he is. Safe and sound, good as new, fat and sassy. Well, well, good, good. Congratulations. And not only that, but yeah. in him someplace, he not only has a good fighting heart, but also that diamond brooch of your wife's. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, um, I'd better go charter a plane. Rollo is due in Kansas City at noon tomorrow. Oh, but it might upset him, Mr. Tiller. Rosie Barron of I was never flown before. He might lose weight. Well, yeah, what, what's the big hurry to get him to Kansas City? Is he booked for a personal appearance? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, hardly that. He, he, he's due to be slaughtered at a special ceremony. Uh, all the plans are made. Oh, I wouldn't want to disappoint my boys. Uh, They've been looking forward to this. Uh-oh. How do you like that? <laughs> Why, it's almost murder. Poor Rollo. Oh, Johnny. Come on, let's get out of here, Alba. Gosh, who would have ever thought I, Johnny Dollar, would have ever gotten so attached to a pig? <laughs> Friends account, item four, 350. Dinner for Alba and me. A vegetable dinner, by the way. And speaking of that reminds me, if you find a $30,000 brooch in a pork chop, it'll only mean that the Blue Ribbon Prime Packing Company didn't have much luck when they went looking for it. Expense account item five, twenty dollars One new gold-plated badge, which I sent to Sheriff Harry Blewett, appeasement, for having stranded him atop that Ferris wheel, for stealing his car, and for suggesting that he use a hungry pig for a bloodhound. Oh, the porter followed the mash scent, all right. Next morning, they found Sheriff Blewett searching an old mash factory, eight miles the wrong side of town. Um, item six, $76.80. Bus and train fare, Carver, Iowa, back to Hartford, Connecticut. But I'm still wondering every morning at breakfast time, what else can you eat with eggs? Except ham or bacon or sausage. And maybe you don't think that's a problem, having known a certain champion named Rollo, Rosie Barron of Iowa. Eh, expense account total $1,463. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, Sammy Hill, and John Daner with Junius Matthews, Ann Morrison, Jack Crucian, and Paul Dubov. Pinto Kolvig with Rollo. The special music is written and conducted by Lee Stevens. <laughs> Be sure to be with us at the same time next week when another most unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Your hit parade on parade will be back tonight in the familiar CBS Jack Benny time with the great tunes of August 12 years ago. Sweet Leilani, and Where or When. Many another still green in your memory will be among the hits you will hear. 
Speaking of hits, put down August 29th this year in your little book. That's when Arthur Godfrey and his talent scout, the stars of Lux Radio Theater, my friend Irma, and Bob Hawk return to join Inner Sanctum. So make your Monday night the regular date with CBS. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Stay tuned now for your hit parade on parade. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I always say if you take a trip halfway around the world, you've got to expect you'll get your ticket punched. <laughs> This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At Insurance Investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator, Johnny Dollar. To the Constant Sun Trading Company, Cairo, Egypt. And uh, may I say, this is an unexpected pleasure. The one thing I didn't expect to bump into during this case was somebody to pay the bill. It started out being my answer to a fire alarm rung 12,000 miles away by an old wartime friend. It wound up being a game of who gets killed first with a bunch of guys who suddenly declared themselves a small peacetime war. The difference of opinion arose over a little hassle I might call the expiring nickels and the Egyptian jackpot. Expense account, item one, $2,200. Air transportation from little old Connecticut to big old French Indochina. Or specifically, Hartford to Haveney. That's why I got off the plane to take a breather. But after smelling the air and getting hit in the face with a bucket full of lukewarm raindrops, I got right on another plane bound for my destination, where I'd been summoned by an urgent cable. Calcutta. <laughs> We took off on instruments in the downpour of a drenching monsoon. It was like climbing up a waterfall, blindfolded. I got chased up to 20,000 feet, clear up into the penthouse by a batch of black-hearted thunderheads laced with lightning. And there we stayed, sucking oxygen for nine dreary hours and waiting for the moment we'd get off our island in the sky. Expense account, item two, three rupees. Transportation from airport to the address of old friend who had summoned me. A place you'd never expect to find trouble. In church. And what a church. Two concert huts on Chowrangi Road. A couple of dozen wooden benches, a retired USO Hammond organ, and most important, this pastor. A guy I'd met when I was calling the CBI Theater, my home away from home, Chaplain Joe Blessing. Johnny, it's good to see you. Long time, Joe. Too long. Well, you haven't changed a bit since you were passing out those SL slips to unhappy GIs. <laughs> so you did decide to stay out here after all. Yeah. Yeah, I decided the East Indian brand of soul needed a little more saving than the kind I used to know back in Magnolia, Tennessee. <laughs> now, come on in the office, Johnny. It was good of you to come right over. You must be wondering why you did. Well, your cable did start a worry or two, Joe. You know, when an ex-soldier gets the trouble call from a chaplain, something's really wrong. What's up? Sit down, sit down. Johnny, tell me. How'd you like to do some work in my department? Wait a minute. I wouldn't know where to start. I'm asking you to save a man's soul. And to save another man's life while you're doing it. Why me, Joe? Why did I ask you to come all the way from Hartford, Connecticut? Well, Johnny, the ways are devious. There wasn't time for me to do anything else. Huh? If I'd gone through the proper channels here, if I'd become involved with all the inevitable red tape, I... Well, there just wasn't time. Johnny, there's a man in Cairo waiting to be executed at dawn day after tomorrow for a murder he didn't commit. And here in Calcutta. And here in Calcutta is a man who not only witnessed that crime, but has in his possession the evidence that can save that man from swinging. Uh-huh. 
Now, who is this man on the flying rope end? Lionel Brook Nichols. He's the president of a vast enterprise called the Thompson Sun Trading Company. Now, Johnny, I wasn't ignoring the fact that you work for a living. I'm sure that if you're successful, you can name your own price. <laughs> this is not a colloquialism, Johnny. But Mr. Brook Nichols has nothing but money. I didn't realize that such big men got into such big trouble. Oh, he didn't get into it all by himself. Huh? Oh, no. Now, this particular big man had the bad luck to have a fun-loving cousin who'd like to see him out of the way and the faster the better. Name of? Miles Atkinson. Uh, he must be some sort of big wheel in the Egyptian government. That's all I know about him. Except that to gain control of the Constant Sun Company, he would move heaven and earth to see Brook Nichols dead. Well, I don't care what he does with the earth, but, uh... I guess I can't stand by and let him mess around with your heaven. Now, let's get out of cases. What about this dude here in Calcutta, the witness with the evidence? Well, his name's William Briggs. He's a very sick man, Johnny. Mm -hmm. Knowing that he might die soon, and it looks like he might, he's had a sudden rush of conscience for the mouth he wants to talk. Evidently, he's decided that since it's too late to save his body, he'd better do a quick job on his soul. And I nurse him to Cairo, is that it? Oh, I'm sending a young assistant of mine who will take that job off your hands. I think you'll like him, Johnny. Now, I want you to get Briggs to the right official. Arrangements have been made for an ambulance to meet you in Cairo. And, well, we've chartered a cargo plane to take you there. Now, the pilot says he can get you there by tomorrow night. Well, I've spent so much time in the air getting here that it shouldn't make any difference. But, uh, why a cargo plane? Why not a passenger plane? They have nice, soft seats. So, Johnny... The airlines refuse to transport a leper. Heaven sure has some good salesmen on the road, and Chaplain Joe Blessings is one of the best. Before I knew it, a big Horizons Unlimited plane was lifting off the runway at Calcutta, and I was in it. Sitting on a suitcase, it looked like I'd never have time to unpack. The invalid Briggs was forward, being bedded down under the gentle hand of Chaplain Joe's assistant, Frankie. Well, that is done. And I give up me Saturday afternoon at Belmont Park for this. You're in luck, Frankie. Think of all the losers you miss betting on. Mr. Dollar, you have the philosophy of a man who has never enjoyed the exquisite thrill of losing his last two dollars upon a horse who was retarding the improvement of the breed. Young man, you've never heard of the bluegrass branch of the Dollar family? Kentucky, sir. Mr. Dollar, sir, uh -huh. if it were not for a certain horse from Kentucky named Breezy Boy who ran a very poor ace at Rockingham, I would not only be a Kentucky colonel, I would be a Kentucky general, passing the time of day with my esteemed co-general, Three-Star Hennessy. <laughs> yes. That's this. Who's briefcase? Briggs. He wants you should take care of it. Now, what's that? What's in it should be in a holster. How do you know? Mr. Dollar, I got a sense of feel. Besides, I looked. It's a Luger. A Luger, huh? Yeah. Off oh, that, I'd say we are now in possession of the evidence. The murder weapon. In person. Exhibit A. Oops. Still loaded. With Exhibit A making an arsenal out of my right coat pocket, we touched wheels at Bombay for three hours and fuel, and then hiked back up for the run across the Arabian Sea. <laughs> landfall high on the coast of Saudi Arabia, and the freight of the Cuff shoreline led us on to the Queen of Sheba's old hometown, Aden, while we sat down again for service, airplane and personal. Frankie and I got our sick man Briggs out and into the shade of a hangar, figuring he'd use a breath of fresh air, but he didn't find it in that sun-baked hellhole. That grubby little ground crew burned up four valuable hours, taking their own unsweet time servicing the ship. That left us just eight hours to get Briggs and his evidence up to Cairo and left me almost enough time to save Mr. Brooke Nichols from taking the rope ride. Estimated time of arrival, midnight. Time of execution, 6 a.m. And I've learned that British officials are hard to wake up. The pilot stood the ship straight on its tail and made a fighter takeoff getting out of there. We were 40 minutes out of Aden, about 5,000 feet above the Red Sea, when we ran into what I've learned to expect in my business, the unexpected. Hello. 
Could uh, either of you gentlemen tell me where I pay my fare? Well, for... Cr- where did you come from? Hey, a walk-on like this I have not seen since Minsky. It's all right, gentlemen. You can pop your eyes back in. You've seen a woman before. Oh, well, I've never scooped one up out of the sky before. Could it be she is an angel? What are you doing here? I... I'm afraid I'm what you'd call a stowaway. How'd you get aboard? When the plane was empty, I locked myself in the powder room. I'm sorry I had to do it this way, but I have to get to Cairo immediately. The next airline flight doesn't go out till 11 tonight. I should write to the captain and have him turn around and dump you back. Please, don't. I'm perfectly willing to pay my way. Don't worry. We can't spare the time. Mr. Dollar, there are only certain things which make air travel a pleasure to certain people. With me, that is a stewardess, and I would be glad to brief her about her duties. Uh, you go check the patient, Frankie. I'll check Miss Stowaway. Uh, that's what comes from always being only an assistant. I noticed that poor man in the stretcher when you took him out. Who is he? Never mind. What's your name? Fate Fabian. Uh, what's so important you've got to get to Cairo this way? Sorry, Mr. Dollar, that's a secret. It's also a secret how you get into that tight little dress you're wearing. I'm glad you like it. A dress, yes. Secrets, no. When I find myself in an airplane with a stowaway, I smell trouble. That trouble you smell costs $85 an ounce. Now, listen, save your sharp talk for a cocktail and don't waste it here. You must think I'm kidding. This is serious. You're flying across international boundaries. Now, who are you? I told you. Fate Fabian. Here. Here is my passport and here is money. How much? Okay. We'll call a sort of bond to ensure your good behavior. Five hundred dollars. All that for good behavior? That's awfully high. So is this airplane. If you don't like it, jump. She didn't jump. And uh, after seven and a half more droning hours, I was glad of it. Great Fabian was all woman. All beautiful. All in a... Pretty nice relief from watching the time run through my wristwatch. She spent most of the trip sharing my suitcase with me. But once I looked up at her, when she was silhouetted against the window, posed against that moonstruck Egyptian sky. And it was almost worth the trip, the way she looked wearing those stars in her hair. Just about then, a vague glow on the horizon took over where my conscience left off. We were coming into Cairo. And the problem of landing 50,000 pounds of airplane replaced the problem of landing 120 pounds of woman. I've never learned how to hold back a sigh of relief when I hear those big tires take a on the runway. And I sighed another one when I saw an ambulance standing by at the parking ramp. By the time the loading platform was pushed into place and the door opened, the ambulance was backed up, ready to receive Briggs. Oh, are you the tech bringing a Mr. Briggs in from Calcutta? Yeah, that's right. Never mind a stretcher, he's on one. Oh, right, sir. We'll fetch him off then. Come along, Roscoe. Come in. You all ready to go, Frankie? Mr. Dollar, watch your language. That is not the thing to say about Mr. Briggs. But he will look at home in that ambulance. Now then. Oh, congratulations upon the trip, Governor. Thanks. Uh, take the other end, Roscoe. Right, we'll hoist the poor chap out of here. Oh, oh, here we go now. Hey, I'd better check with the pilot, Frankie. Give these guys a hand, will you? They may need it getting down that ramp. Anything that moves me toward the end of this is a pleasure. Easy now. You want me to help lift him in? Hey. Hey, Mr. Dollar. These guys need this plane ambulance, but... <laughs> In just a moment, we return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first, whatever you're planning to do over the Labor Day weekend, be sure to plan to listen over most of these same stations tonight to a wonderful new show on CBS. It's Horace Heights' original Youth Opportunity Show, a full half hour of fun and excitement. You'll get the thrill of a lifetime hearing talented young Americans get the chance of a lifetime. Don't forget, Sunday night with Horace Heights. The Horace Height Original Youth Opportunity Show, starting tonight on CBS. Tune in, tune in this fall, for the show that you love best of all. Listen carefully, here's the address. It's CBS, CBS. 
Now with our star, Charles Russell, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. made four steps toward the cockpit when I heard Frankie yell, and a half a step back toward the door when I heard the shots. By the time I got to the top of the ramp, the ambulance was about 20 yards away, and pitted against that distance were two overlapping thoughts. One, the way to stop, or at least slow it down, was to puncture the rear tires. Two, the tool at hand was that loaded Exhibit A Luger that should have been in my pocket. It wasn't there. I looked around, didn't see it, but I thought I knew where to find it. Come on. Come on, open up. Or I'll put this fire extinguisher through that door. And if your head isn't in the way, I'll get that Wait neck. Wait a minute. Mo, don't use the same hiding place twice. It could be that I wasn't hiding. And it could be that that purse is now holding a looter. Uh, Give me it. Yeah. Now all I need is to hear you say you don't know how it got there. I don't know how it got there. That does it. Come on, you're coming with me. Come on, get going. <laughs> Ouch! You don't have to do that. What I did have to do was dig up some transportation. It turned out to be a taxi whose driver had slept through the excitement and therefore was the only one at the hack stand. I think he was still asleep when I gave my unwilling companion an ungentlemanly shove into the rear seat. And we left. Nobody in full control of their faculties could drive the way he did. He knew he had a horn, but somebody had forgotten to tell him about brakes. All I had to go on was the direction in which that ambulance had taken off. Straight toward Cairo. So, that's where we went. Straight toward Cairo. Come on, whatever your name is, sit up and start your story. My name is Faith Fabian. Well, I couldn't be less interested. What I want to know is where are those friends of yours take Bridge and Frank? I have no friends. I can believe that. <laughs> Whatever those thugs are, where are they? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't be coy. You and those mugs in that ambulance add up, that's all. Doesn't take any brains to make your outlet. You're all working for the same guy. What same guy? Miles Atkinson. The guy that's trying to keep witness Briggs and his evidence from saving Brooke Nichols from hanging. About five and a half hours. From You're now. being stupid. Maybe so. All I know is somebody got away with a witness. And I find the evidence sharing your purse with your eyebrow. I found it on the plane. Somebody must have dropped oh, it. Oh, don't give me that. You can probably recite the serial number. Okay. You want the murder weapon? I'm going to be a real nice guy, just long enough to give it to you. And then I'm going to give you to the police. They have a nice little game they play with combinations like that. Hello. Uh, are you the chief inspector? I am. Now, this girl keeps telling me her name is Faith Fabian. How do you do, Inspector? I've looked forward to this. I'll bet. Well, my name is Johnny Dollar. I'm looking for somebody who knows the Brooke Nichols case. Well, you certainly came to the right place. I know about the Brooke Nichols case. Well, that's what I'm here about. You can bust that case wide open, Inspector. Brooke Nichols is innocent. Now, here. This Luger is all the evidence we'll need. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Uh, one thing you'll still have to help me find, though, is a man named Briggs. Uh, he was an eyewitness to the murder. I brought him all the way from Calcutta, and somebody put the snatch on him at the airport. Not only that, they grabbed the guy who was helping me. Oh, yes. Yes, that would be the obstreperous young gentleman you call Frankie. Oh, you know where he is? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Then he's all right? Yes. If you could call a man all right when he's just been arrested for the murder of Mr. Briggs. Murder? Yes. Mr. Briggs was shot in the ambulance that took him from your plane. Hey, what is this? This is a very good time for both of you to remain perfectly still, Mr. Dollar. After you raise your hand, uh, Miss Fabian, you needn't bother. There's hardly enough of that dress to conceal all of you, let alone a weapon. Thank you. Mr. Dollar, this is what a romanticist would call a poetic injustice. You see, this Luger, the evidence, as you call it, happens to belong to me. But that's the murder weapon. 
Who are you, anyway? Chief of Inspectors, Miles Atkinson. Miles Atkinson? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I fly 5,000 miles from Calcutta to put you in the hands of the police. And you turn out to be the police. Yes. Uh, bloody convenient, isn't it? Not for me, it isn't. Here, steady, old boy. You know, this gun was probably the most fortunate purchase I ever made in my life. First, it killed a man who was in my way. Then, because it disappeared, it made it possible for me to establish false evidence, ostensibly proving that my esteemed cousin, Brooks Nichols, was guilty of the murder. And now, his death by hanging will place in my hands the controlling interest of the Constant Sun Trading Company. Quite a bargain. Thank you, Mr. Dollar. Not you, the gun. Which I shall now put to its final use. And after it is disposed of you two, I shall dispose of it. That was the prettiest confession I've ever heard. I'm surprised that a chief inspector and bargain hunter should sell himself out so cheaply. What do you mean by that? That the confession was complete, voluntarily made in front of witnesses, and that we are leading with it, and that you are coming with us. Hey, fight, baby, take it easy. No sense going on to make for a hot bullet. Mr. Dollar is right. I warn you, the one who moves first dies first. Very well. Hey, one step closer, Miss Fabian. I'm not afraid of you. All right, you ask for it. Now take it. What is this? No use. What no pull it. No, you can't stop me. No, you won't. It's been ladies' day so far. Now it's boys' time. Look how he's trying to die. He did throw the gun, but not at me. At the single light fixture in the middle of a ceiling. And when that went out, so did Atkinson. Out through the door. And the chase was on. It was no joke. He knew where the light switches were, and he, as he went racing past them, he switched them off. It was like night flying without the benefit of carrots in my diet. Chasing him down those long, empty, echoey corridors and up the stairs to the roof. At the door of the roof, I threw on a brake by throwing it on our face. He was soft. And it was dark, but I was scared. I figured Atkinson might have picked up a weapon on the way. And that turned out to be an underestimate. What he had picked up was a fire hose. When we stepped through the door, we got hit by a big fat bolt of liquid lightning. A couple of hundred pounds of water backed up by a couple of thousand pounds of pressure. It felt like a salmon swimming upstream to spawn. But at the edge of the roof braced against the low parapet was Atkinson, using all his weight to keep the writhing nozzle from flipping him around. He was just one man on a fire department's area. Hey, I'm over on the other side. Try and throw that water off you. Get over that valve. See it? Where? That wheel over there. The end of the hose he ain't on. Pull off the water. Come on. I see it. I got it. Of dropping away to a dribble, the hose suddenly snapped its muscle up to its hardest as a driving surge of water went through it. Ah! And before Atkinson could get himself untangled from the canvas and rubber snake, it snapped him over the parapet, off the roof, and high into the night. Hey, Fate, turn off that water! Justice, baby. That fire hose threw Mr. Chief Inspector Atkinson off the roof. And he made a hole in one. Right through that gallows down there. The same gallows from which Brooke Nichols was supposed to hang in a few hours. That's horrible. Let's, let's move away from here. Uh, hey, wait a minute. That's not like you. After all, you're the gal who turned that water up and stood it down. You wanted it done right. Why didn't you send a plumber? I won't ask you whether you meant it that way or not. As far as I'm concerned, it out, turned out just jolly this way. Oh, and uh, while I'm at it, I'd like to thank you for taking such a brave chance with my life downstairs in the office. Oh, really, Mr. Dollar? I knew that gun wasn't loaded. I unloaded it myself back in the powder room in the airplane. Just before you accused me of trying to steal it, remember? The next time I take a shower, I promise to wash my mouth out with soap. But now I figure it's also about time you came clean. Really, now, who are you? I'm sorry, my name is still Fate Fabian. All right, you've made a sale. Your name is Fate Fabian. Well, what's your interest in this case? No interest at all. It's just part of my job. They do hire people to police the police, you know. I happen to be one of those people. Do you want to see my credentials? 
Your credentials look all right to me, baby. We got off the subject, off the roof, and into the problem of getting Brooke Nichols off the end of a rope. After going through those motions, and that gal made all the motions, including retrieving young Frankie to the pokey, I kissed Faith Baby and goodbye, just for luck. And receiving no interest on an investment, we headed back to the airfield. By the time that fireball Egyptian sun poked its top rim over the leftover GI issue hangers at the east end of the field, the plane was serviced and panning to pry open the sky. Came the time to board ship, came a visitor. I say, old boy, Mr. Duller about. Yeah, about right here. Oh, splendid, splendid. I'm Lionel Brooke Nichol. Congratulations. I suppose you know you saved my life. Yeah, with a lot of help, yeah. Well, I should like to make it up to you somehow. Is there anything I can do? Well, uh, besides paying my expenses... Oh, naturally, naturally. Send your check to the Constant Sun Trading Company. You'll be paid post-haste. But beyond that... Well, uh, it could do something for the guy who got me out here. Back in Calcutta, I have an old army buddy named a Chaplain Joe Blessings. He runs a church. Oh, splendid, splendid. Perhaps I could donate a stained glass window or uh, anything you suggest. Did you say anything? Yes, anything. Okay. Well, look... Chaplain Joe Blessings doesn't need a stained glass window because he hasn't got any place to put it. What he does need is a new church. A real one with steeples and all that. Oh. Oh. All right, then. Very well. Done. Expense account, item three. Same as original entry. Transportation from the land of the Sphinx to the land of the free, by way of Calcutta, where I delivered a happier, though wiser, Frankie. Received the blessings of Chaplain Joe Blessing and ordered a custom-made, lightweight, pearl-handled blackjack in blue suede and inscribed to Fate Fabian with the hope that you will never fail to supply the black to go with this blue. Love, J.D. Ah, uh, well, I guess that's all. Oh, uh, expense account total. Oh, wait, uh, there's one more. Expense account item four. Ten dollars. Paid to Cassidy's Pawn Shop, Hartford, Connecticut, for a purchase of one Hawk Air Medal. After all that flying, I thought I deserved one. Now, uh, expense account total, $5,350.40. If you don't think the founder of your company is worth that, kindly suggest someone who might. Yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Jack Edwards, Polly Bear, and Paul Dubov. The special music is written and conducted by Leith Stevens. Be sure to be with us again when Johnny Dollar returns to the air after a short vacation. Listen on Saturday, October 1st. When another most unusual expense account is handed in by yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Next week at this time on many of these same stations, Steve Arden will bring you the madcap adventures of America's favorite schoolmistress, our Miss Brooks. Miss Arden, who has been heard later on Sunday evening for more than a year, is moving to this new time, and CBS cordially invites you to hear her and her famous brand of comedy. To make sure, consult your local newspaper listening next Sunday for the new time when you'll hear Eve Arden and our Miss Brooks. Now, stay tuned for your hit parade on parade, which follows immediately over the same CBS network station. This is Roy Rowan speaking. This is C.
CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.